Today I'm talking about exposure therapy. I'm going to highlight some of the principles of exposure therapy and I'm also going to talk about uh, what to do to make it more effective and what not to do in exposure therapy. I'm Paige Pradko. Welcome to Therapy for a Better Life. So there are mounds of evidence about why exposure therapy is effective and, and how it is one of the most effective treatment methods for uh, agoraphobia, for panic disorder, OCD, phobias, PTSD, social anxiety disorder, and a number of other anxiety disorders. But unfortunately, it's only used about 19% of the time in therapy. That was discovered by uh, a research project called uh, the Harvard Brown Anxiety Research Project. And they attributed to the low training and use of exposure therapy as just something that the therapists were not trained in. Uh, so I thought today it would be a, a good opportunity to talk a little about, about exposure therapy and the basics and how to do it. And, uh, and also some of the key points about uh, what to do and what not to do. So first of all, um, exposure therapy is, uh, you know, kind of what, what it sounds like. It is just this treatment that encourages the uh, systematic exposure to a feared stimuli. Now the feared stimuli may be external things like different objects or situations or environments or activities. And it also may be internal in us. The feared stimuli may be our own internal thoughts, images, or our body sensations that we're just really uncomfortable with. So the purpose of exposure therapy is just to bring this fear reaction down so that a person can be exposed to whatever the feared stimuli is and not have a full-blown panic attack or a fear response. You may have heard about Hebb's Law. I talked about it in my video on, on panic disorder. Uh, Hebb's Law is that neurons that fire together wire together. So let me talk ab about this a little bit. Uh, our amygdala, the fear center of our brain, learns. It learns what to be afraid of. And it learns through association. And so, for example, if I am in the grocery store and I just happen to have panic symptoms or high anxiety. And let's say it has nothing to do with the grocery store, but I happen to have it while I'm in the grocery store. My brain learns from association. And so now my amygdala has picked up that, oh, grocery stores are something to be afraid of. I better turn on this full sympathetic nervous system response whenever she's in the grocery store. And then what do I do? Oh boy, I start avoiding grocery stores. All of these things start making the fear response even stronger. But the good news is that through exposure therapy, we can retrain our amygdala that grocery stores are nothing to be afraid of. And we do that by exposure sessions where I am exposing myself to the experience of being in the grocery store. This is called actually retraining, rewiring our amygdala. We are setting down brand new neural pathways that the grocery store is safe. So there are different types of exposure therapy. There's gradual exposure therapy and there's flooding exposure therapy. There's also something called strategic exposure therapy. Now, gradual exposure therapy means that I'm gonna start off with my kind of easy exposures. If I have a list of things that I'm avoiding and a list of things that I'm fearful of, I'm going to make a hierarchy. I'm going to kind of put them all in a list. I'm going to give them all a number of how terrible that is for me. We call it a SUDS score, S-U-D-S, SUDS. And it stands for Subjective Unit of Discomfort Scale. 
And so I'm gonna put them all in a list. And with gradual, I'm gonna start off with the ones that have a very low SUD score, exposures that I think I can get through without a whole lot of problems. And then as I go down my list, I'm gonna to go to more and more difficult ones as I get my confidence up. Now flooding is a type of exposure where I am going to flood myself fully in a situation that really makes me uncomfortable. And so if I go back to my grocery store example, let's say I gave the grocery store a SUDS score of 80. We give a score between one and 100, 80, that's pretty bad. Uh, now, if that would be a flood, if I went right into a grocery store exposure without working my way up, that would be flooding myself. Now, we can practice uh, exposures in different ways. We can practice them in vivo, which means in real life, means I'm walking into the grocery store. We can practice them imaginal. I'm going to imagine myself getting ready driving to the grocery store, walking into the grocery store. We can do it through virtual reality. And I have never done this, but I've heard that it is very effective and the research is very promising. We also have an exposure therapy called interoceptive. Interoceptive exposure therapy is used for people that have a difficult time tolerating their own body sensations. Many people with agoraphobia have difficult time tolerating a rapid heartbeat. In fact, that can send them right into panic symptoms, just feeling a rapid heartbeat. So we have to do exposure therapies just on physical body sensations before we begin anything else really. Uh, now I did mention strategic exposure therapy. And I might do a whole nother video on strategic exposure therapy, but that is, uh, instead of assigned exposures, any time during the day that we have high anxiety, we're gonna take the opportunity to stay in that exposure and do nothing and wait until our anxiety drops on its own. I'm gonna, I, I think it's an interesting uh, theory and I'm gonna talk about that in a different video. Um, but let me get right to what is going to help us have more effective exposure therapies, more success at exposure therapy and I'm gonna point out some things to not do in exposure therapy. First of all, we've learned from research that we have to activate to generate. And what that means is we have to activate our amygdala. When we talk about an activated amygdala, we mean we are in a highly anxious, anxious state. So in order for our brain to put down a new neural pathway and to learn that something is not dangerous, we have to be very anxious, our, our amygdala has to be activated in order for new neurons to be formed, in order this new neural pathway to be formed. Uh, it's called activate to generate. We have to activate the amygdala to generate a new neural pathway. Exposure therapy doesn't work if we're calm. We have to be anxious for it to work. And then over the exposure, we actually let our anxiety calm down on its own. Uh, I mentioned flooding exposure therapy. We know that flooding exposure therapy works much faster than gradual. Kind of makes sense. But I like my clients to know that because I don't want them to be afraid that, oh, they tried something that is just too hard for them. I say, no you're doing a good job. You're actually working harder to get yourself better faster. So new neural pathways, the learning process in the amygdala goes much faster with a higher exposure, a more intensity of the anxiety, works better. Number three, I would like people to know that relaxation makes it more, makes it less effective. Uh, it is not helpful it in, uh, attenuates, which means it just uh, reduces the effectiveness of exposure therapy if we are trying to relax ourselves, We are, the, the whole purpose of exposure therapy is to be anxious in the situation and just stay there, don't do anything to calm down, just wait for the anxiety to drop on its own. Number four, I like people to know how long to stay in the exposure. Now, 
research has shown us that an hour and a half is typically a very good exposure time to stay in the exposure. But we've learned a little bit more. We've learned that if you can stay in an exposure situation until your anxiety drops by about half, then you have just completed a successful exposure. So let me go back to my grocery store example. If I'm in the grocery store and I gave that a SUDS score of 80, then I'm gonna stay in the grocery store until I feel my anxiety come down about halfway, which means a 40 or less, then I'm free to leave the grocery store. I've just done a completed a, a very good exposure. Now, leaving too early, if I got to the grocery store and I was feeling so much anxiety, which of course is good, uh, but I just thought, oh, I can't do it, and I run out and I go home. Well, the minute I get into the car, the minute I get out of the grocery store, my anxiety starts to drop. And what I've done there is I've just trained my brain that my brain was correct. Grocery stores are a terribly scary place and I should never go in them because my anxiety will drop when I leave. And so we don't want that to happen in exposure. That actually reinforces the fear and anxiety. And so when I, I let my clients know, when you decide upon an exposure, you have to be 100% committed to finishing it. You don't wanna do an exposure and then jump out of it. You wanna stay and finish that exposure. Your anxiety will drop on its own. The last, uh, or I'm sorry, number six, is I want people to know about benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines, uh, they call them anti-anxiety medications. I'm talking about medications like Xanax and Ativan and Clonopin. These all make exposure therapy ineffective. Uh, they, the medications calm down the amygdala, the fear center of the brain. And when that happens, when we're on those medications, we cannot learn new information. We cannot store that learned information into our longer term memory. So we cannot create these new neural pathways when we're on any type of benzodiazepine. So I advise my clients to go off of benzodiazepines according to medical advice with their doctor in or before they can even begin exposure therapy. Uh, and the final note I wanna make is about safety behaviors. So safety behaviors are things like, I'm gonna keep medicine in my pocket just in case I get into an exposure and have a panic situation. Or I'm gonna have a safety person with me. Or I'm gonna check and see where the local hospital is. Um, all of these type of uh, behaviors are called safety behaviors. And they make uh, exposure therapy less effective because our brain knows that you have those safety behaviors going on. And the safety behaviors actually reinforce that the original fear was correct. And so we don't wanna have any safety behaviors if we are doing exposure therapy. Now, I do realize that when we're doing gradual exposures, sometimes at the beginning exposures, somebody may wanna have a safety person with them. We talk about that in session and we decide if that's the right thing to do. And knowing eventually we have to do the exposure without the safety person there. So. If you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please remember to like the video. And I would love to hear a comment from you. Uh, did you learn something new today? Uh, what have you done in the past? Or do you have a question? I love to answer comments on the videos. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel because I try to touch on uh, a new topic every week, something that would be helpful for people that are, are suffering or just wanna learn something new about a mental health technique. So don't forget to hit subscribe. So until next week, I will see you in session. Take care. Bye-bye.